morning, good morning. Happy almost Merry Christmas. For today's video, we are going to do a laundry chat and a bit of a year end review. So a bit of housekeeping before we even get into today's video. Friday's newsletter, if there was ever a newsletter to sign up for, um, if you're not a part of the newsletter, this week is the week. Sign up today because tomorrow I am releasing for free for you guys. It's an amazing resource that this is something I've kind of been doing behind the scenes by myself for years um, and it has paid so many dividends in my life. Um, and so this year I put together like a little follow along workbook that you guys can work through. And by the time you're done the workbook, you are going to have like a clear focus of what your goals are for next year, as well as have a really accurate reflection on 2020, what 2020 taught you, really visually where you're at and where you wanna go. And it also helps you identify how to get there. It's, it's incredible. And it also goes through every room of the house um, to sort of take inventory on things. I go through this kind of Q4 review for those of us who work in like more of a corporate setting to kind of look at, are you gonna help me fold? You can, you can fold with me? Yeah. Thank you. You know, kind of a year end review. Well, we don't wanna fold with that kind of attitude, you know? We want it, we wanna come at our tasks with a little bit more positivity, you know? Every year I have taken a couple days to kind of reflect on the year before, make plans for the next year. I always choose a word for the following year that's gonna kind of help guide me. I also, starting Boxing Day, clean the bejuice out of my house, which I didn't even realize is a very like Chinese New Year tradition. The idea is that you like clear all the stagnant energy in your house so that you can bring in new fresh energy. You know, there's something to it because every year I go a little bit crazy and I go through a big decluttering, I go through a big cleaning and I just, I'm not a New Year's person because New Year's is usually large social groups, late nights and loud noises and those are those are the three of my least favorite things. <laughs> so I've never been a New Year's person. You know, successful New Year's is asleep by 8 p.m. for me, really any night. There's something about kind of doing a year end life audit for yourself and a year end full cleaning that just is so dang satisfying. I put that resource together for you guys. You can kind of go through it. I'm gonna be doing it over this weekend. And you can know that yours truly will be going through the process over the weekend. And I will probably be, probably, are you saying thank you to yourself while you're putting things in the basket? Brighton started referring to herself as a good girl. She'll do something then she'll say, a good girl. <laughs> are you a good girl? Yeah. So I will be all up over um, Instagram stories the whole weekend kind of sharing how I'm working through it. So how I envision this going in a perfect world is that we all kind of do it together and we spur each other on. Good girl, yeah. Um, over the weekend and just... That's right. And again, that resource is totally free. I thought I would do for today's video, just kind of go through, you know, what happened um, in my life, there was a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes that I never really talked about and share kind of what was happening publicly and what was happening privately. So I did have my phone for this, but uh, I'm not naming any names, but somebody has absconded with my cellular device. Oh, no. Gosh, I just pegged a crime on her and she wasn't even guilty. Mom of the year over here. All right, let's dive in. Are you a good girl? Yeah. Oh my gosh, I haven't even had this channel for a year. I've had this channel for nine months. My first video was posted end of February. Wow, okay. What was happening between 
January and when I started this channel, the culmination of a battle that was about three, uh, two years long of me kind of deciding whether or not it was time to say goodbye to my vlog channel which is how I started on YouTube. Guys, that was a really hard decision to make. I'm gonna get real, real raw and some, spill some tea in this video because I don't know, I'm, I'm in the mood to spill some tea. Mm. That channel really is a metaphor <laughs> for how a lot of unhealthy relationships unfold. It starts out as something kind of light and breezy. I started that channel as a hobby and then it got serious. You're in the, the honeymoon phase where everything is great. And then I feel like that channel got real toxic real quick for me. I had just tied it to so much of my worth. I had put so much pressure on myself to like be a YouTuber and be successful because it had turned into kind of by accident a, a, a full-time career. You know, there was a period of time where when I was pouring into that channel as someone needs to, to be really successful on YouTube, it was burning me out. It was sucking my soul. <laughs> in a lot of ways. And so there was this real struggle of like, you know, the money was good. I was making good money. There was two years in a row where I was making more than my ex-husband was making. And he makes great money, um, rightfully so. He works his, took us off, he deserves it. You know, I was making great money. Unless you're, you're in the industry and you really kind of understand the ins and outs, you wouldn't necessarily understand that because my views weren't out of this world, my subs weren't out of this world, but though that doesn't matter as much as people think it matters who aren't in the industry. I was making at some points double what, yeah, double what people were making who had like 500,000 subs and were getting 200,000 views on each video because you know, YouTube is definitely six degrees of separation and when I would talk to other YouTubers, and they would learn what I was making. They were like, girl, what am I doing wrong? Which is how I started my consulting business. But anyway, all that to say, money was great, but it was soul sucking in a lot of way. I had never been down for like the fame aspect of YouTube. I have always been kind of uncomfortable with the notoriety aspect of YouTube. So it just started taking its toll where I felt like a really poorly paid prostitute because I got to the point where I was unwilling to do what I needed to do to continue making the money that I was making. You know, it was like money and ethics suddenly were on opposite ends of the spectrum. Maybe I can do a whole video. If you guys want a whole video on just that topic, I could do a whole video on just that topic. Let me know in the comments because I don't want to spend this whole video talking about that. Just the type of person I am, I, you know, money doesn't impress me. I will always choose, F I mean, I'm not going to cry about making money, but it's not my motivating factor of this channel or my brand at all. And, you know, so I chose to make far less money um, to maintain making videos that I felt good about putting up. But it just, it got to a point where I had to look at how much effort am I putting into this channel um, in terms of the time it takes to create sponsored content, um, to go back and forth with negotiating with brands, to think about content that my audience wants to see, to shoot that content, to edit that content, to then package that content of creating a thumbnail and what are you gonna put in the SEO and, you know, at that point, I think I was posting three days a week, maybe even five days a week. And I got to a point where I was like, I'm sorry, I'm like working myself to the bone. And, but the type of content I'm making, you know, I'm not making a lot of money and it just became not worth it. And then on top of it, the only videos that would get views were like the salacious videos about my personal life. And I just got to a point where I was like, you know, I was behind the scenes um, going through a um, separation at that point. My marriage had ended and I just wasn't up for the critique, you know? The only content that was getting views was content that was salacious. And I was like, listen, if I was interested in 
being famous and make I could just easily pimp out all the juicy details about my divorce. It would have skyrocketed my vlog channel. I would have made tons of money um, and I would have lost all my moral code in, in the creation of that. Came to this crossroads where I just realized it was time to say goodbye to that channel. It had become toxic in a myriad of ways and it was much like a toxic relationship. It was very hard to, to let go of because much like a toxic relationship, it's not all bad, um, but it gets to a point where the bad outweighs the good. But at that point, you're almost so romanced by the toxicity that you, it's hard to see the forest for the trees and it's hard to, to know when to say goodbye. And anyone who's been in a toxic relationship, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So I am so glad that I did shut that channel down. Best life decision I ever made was taking that leap of faith. And so I started <laughs> this new channel and the focus of the new channel, I was like, you know, I am going to still talk about my personal life as it pertains to self-growth, intentional living, minimalism, overcoming my own childhood trauma. You know, girlfriend, you're sort of unfolding the things that I'm folding. And it's just, it's a little counterproductive. And I was gonna say goodbye to talking about the aspect of my personal life that I had gotten to a point where that aspect of my personal life was not up for public consumption. My children were not up for public consumption. The demise of my marriage was not up for public consumption. What a mentally healthy decision that was. Oh, I vey, past L, chef's kiss. What a wonderful choice that was. But what was happening behind the scenes was my marriage ended in the fall. I've had so many people be like, what happened? Um, and to be honest, I'm, just, I'm not gonna talk about all the aspects. You know, the Reader's Digest version is after years of intense therapy, my ex-husband and I were going to therapy for about three years, bi-weekly for about three years. So I was going one week, he was going the next week, we were both going the week after that, and then we took a week of respite and implementing what we had learned and repeat for three years. We gave it the good old college try. After three years of intensive therapy and under the, the guidance of a therapist that we both still trust implicitly, and after some things had come to light and, and you know some events had taken place, it ended in the fall. I feel like coming to that decision was inarguably the hardest decision certainly I have ever had to make. I assume the same stands for Dan, but I feel like making the decision, which was much harder than sticking to or following through with the decision. Once the decision had been made, I haven't had, personally, I can only speak for myself, one day or one moment of questioning whether it was the right decision or not or regretting it which I think speaks volumes. So, but that was privately going on. When do I share this? How do I share this? How much of this do I share? Facing the real, you know, possibility that sharing this would also end any sort of digital career that I had spent the last five years carving out for myself. And just think about that for a minute. What other career on earth is there, other than being like a celebrity, where you have a real risk of just living your truth publicly that your marriage is ending also means you could lose your job because of it. That wouldn't happen to a banker. You know, facing the possibility of losing my marriage and my career simultaneously. It was, it was, it was a time, let me tell you. So the original plan was that Dan would stay in the house till June so as not to disrupt the kids' lives during a school year. Um, but there were some, you know, terms and conditions for that as outlined by our therapist. That was the plan. And then, you know, some events unfolded that made that not possible. So, and so Dan moved out in January, I believe. Um, in and around the time that I was shutting down the channel. So privately, I had made this huge career decision that was very difficult to make. Um, I was facing the fact that my career might be over and I might be, you know, 35, three kids in, 
single and having to find a new career. And the person that I had spent the last, you know, seven years with was no longer and wasn't living in the house anymore. So it was, January was, January was big. <laughs> <laughs> it was very difficult. And then, so February, I launched this channel. I had spent the fall till January mourning losing the vlog channel, mourning losing my marriage, and, and you know, mourning my, my spouse moving out. So that's sad. But then I had also spent January really taking time to craft what do I want this new channel to be? How am I going to keep it um, safe? for my mental health because the vlog channel, I had not done a good job of that. I didn't want this new channel to be just voyeurism. I wanted it to, to provide a real value and asking myself, listen, if you don't think you can provide a real value, girl, get a new job. I also at that point had started, you know, reigniting this passion for pottery that I had had in my past that I had kind of it had sort of gone dormant and I, it was in the, the embers were, were glowing. So February, I launched the channel. I haven't looked back since. I can say that I have been proud of the videos that I have put up on this channel. I have been proud of the value that I think I'm adding. No, no, these are all folded. We're gonna keep them that way. I know you don't like being told no, me either, to be honest. And I, you know, who I am and how, much more self-aware and self-loving I am to, to myself. <laughs> so Dan had moved out, I hadn't spoken about it. Even in my real life, only a very small handful of people were aware of what was taking place because as open as I am, I also am very aware of mental health and I knew that I was in too vulnerable of a state. The court, the court of public opinion could really affect my mental health and so I just didn't tell a lot of people. I just chose to, to really kind of hunker down and, and self-preserve my mental health and really just focus on making sure the transition was as healthy as it could be for my kids. I also had to look at a lot of the finances, you know, in the short term, who was going to stay in this house and what that would look like. And there was a lot of logistics to, to be worked out in February. The day after Valentine's Day, which was my dad's birthday, um, my grand died. And I'm not going to cry. Um, she was one of the most influential people in my life. And so in March, I went to her funeral with Brighton in England and uh, got to see West Cottage, got to say goodbye to my gran. It actually was really cathartic to go to a place that had always been sacred land to me during one of the most difficult times of my life. My gran had passed, but I, I felt like I was being carried through the most difficult time in my life while I was there, which is totally the Holy Spirit. And that was when COVID had become much more mainstream. At that point, people were kind of taking it seriously, realizing that it was like a big thing. While I was over there is when there was talk of closing the borders because governments were quick some governments were quickly realizing this is spreading far more than we are able to control um, and so there was even a worry of whether I could get back into the country in time for them to shut borders so I think the day after I landed back in Canada or possibly the day after that is when lockdown like you know North American lockdown happened um, for a couple of months after that um, I was the sole parent in, in the kid's life, not throwing shade. He chose to not see the kids. Um, there was a couple months where I was the only parent parenting them. I was the only one who was present. I was the only one they were seeing. And I also had to field all of those questions that came from them about that. Um, amidst balancing three jobs and the fact that, you know, Ford was now gonna have to be homeschooled, launching this new channel and dealing with my own stuff, starting the legal separation process. Those were some, some really difficult months. And yet, as I said, she's dragging a stool. 
I never questioned my decision. It was like, this is hard, but a good kind of hard. The same kind of hard that a workout is, where like it hurts while you're working out, but you know you're doing a good thing. You know, it's funny looking back, I, I talked a lot about like self-empowerment and focusing on the things that matter and intentional living. And that's because, you know, behind the scenes, that's what I was facing. You know, things got lighter with the COVID restrictions and started coming around and seeing the kids, which was great for everyone. I started taking West Cottage much more seriously, a, a potential e-commerce store that I could start running. She's using this stool as like, you know, those like learn to walk pushers. I feel like those embers that were glowing about West Cottage, I feel like it was a time where I received this blessing, I guess you could call it, of like, this chapter of your life is closing and these doors are closing and your life does not look how you thought it was gonna look at 36, but this whole world is about to open up for you in a way that you can't even imagine yet. And it reminds me of that Bible quote, for I have plans for you, says the Lord, plans to plans for you to prosper. I mean, I'm definitely paraphrasing. Working through the legalities of a divorce, um, thank God it was a very amicable process. We didn't argue about anything, mostly because there wasn't really anything to argue over. There was no negotiating because I was just asking for the, the bare minimum. I wasn't looking to take anyone to the cleaners, I wasn't looking for a payday, but it was still difficult. I mean, it's not fun to go through a divorce. It's not fun to know that you're doing that to and for your kids. It's not fun to face those inevitable questions and thoughts of, am I gonna die alone under a highway somewhere eating Alpo with cats eating my face? Not really the vision I had for my life. A lot of unknowns and yet I also felt this carried sense of like, there's something in store for me. And as, as difficult as this is, I know it's that good kind of difficult and I know that whenever I get to the other side of that, it's gonna be a good life. And so I clung to that during the dark times. I began to share the news and that was very hard to hit publish on that Instagram post because I had spent so much time cleaning the emotional, financial, physical, all the ills. I had finally felt like I could see the forest for the trees and I was like, here we go. Now I'm posting it in, in the court of public opinion and <laughs> people be out for blood. When did I announce it? July 1st, yeah, I was gonna say, I think it was the summer. Between then and school starting with the kids, Cohen started kindergarten, being public with as public as I'm willing to be about the divorce. Um, everything was finalized pretty much when I announced it, legally speaking. There's still a lot of unknowns. I think the hardest part was knowing that people were going to take a crumb of information and make a cake out of it. I mean, sure, in real life, when anyone goes through something like that, of course, on a fairly micro scale, this happens, but like in what other life other than being a celebrity, which I am clearly not, nor do I wanna be, is there this like macro investigation and microscope of your personal life. Um, and I think because I have gotten to such a strong mental health space and kind of dealing with my childhood trauma space, I have come to a place of realizing how unhealthy it really is, I think for anyone, to cut open their chest and bear all their personal intimate stuff for the court of public opinion, I think it is wildly unhealthy. Thank God I got to a point where I just realized I wasn't up for doing that with myself anymore. There was this like almost martyr, which is kind of embarrassing to admit, but almost this like martyr aspect where I felt like I am, typically women are, are critiqued more heavily than men. I think certainly online, I had this mindset of almost Yes, I know that I get picked apart and I get critiqued and I get inaccurately characterized, but I'm doing it for the women who have experienced or are experiencing the trauma that I have experienced who need the light that I wish I had had when I was going through it to say, 
you can get through it and you will get through it and you will be stronger because of it. This will not define you, it will shape you and it will strengthen you. And so I almost was willing to be that martyr because I believed so strongly in my message. I think I have come to a place, thank God, of realizing I can still spread that message without having to put my own mental health in such a vulnerable state. You know, that was the hardest thing about going public was knowing that it was kind of like ripping a band-aid off of being like, all right, this is gonna be, this is gonna open up. People thinking that they know a marriage they didn't know. People thinking that they know the details of a divorce that they don't know. People thinking that they know the motivations of the people who were involved in the marriage when they don't. Newsflash, in case this is news to anybody, nobody that you watch online is giving 100% of the story. Nobody. Also, I had produced not a false version of myself or my marriage, but a produced version of myself and my marriage. The alternative would be ludicrous to put on the internet. I knew what it was gonna look like. I knew that because furniture was gonna stay in this house for a period of time, because I was gonna stay in this house for a period of time, that it was going to look like I was some gold digger who took Dan to the cleaners, Ellie, down in front, and it was gonna look like I got everything and he got nothing, and I had to just kind of let that be what it looked like. And you know, I'm proud of myself that I didn't feel the need to justify it. People who have paid attention to the type of person I am over the last seven years, they should know damn well that I would never do that to someone. And that is why 90% of you have not held that opinion and 90% of you have seen what things actually were and are. But you know, in some ways I understand why that 10% has been so volatile because I do get what it looks like. And I'm proud of myself for not feeling the need to like justify it, especially because to go into all the details of everything would be to talk about things that I don't want to be out on the internet. I'm proud of myself. I have no Fs to give. <laughs> the very, unfortunately very loud 10% who think that that's what transpired. Because I know the truth, the people in my life know the truth, Dan knows the truth, my kids know the truth, and you know, whomever I'm going to spend my life with in the future will know the truth, and God knows the truth, and I'm good with that. And that's kind of, where things have been now through the fall and, and in through now my behind the scenes consulting business. It's something I never really talk about on this channel, but it's just kind of like my side hustle that helps me generate income as a single mom, which is necessary to be able to stay in this house for now. In all likelihood, this house will be sold at some point because um, I won't be able to, to afford to stay in it because to do so, I would have to buy Dan out um, and I, I I can't afford to do that. You know, I, I have been doing this side hustle to just try and make ends meet and try and save as much as I can um, to, if there is any chance of me saving this house um, and, and buying Dan out, it's what I'm gonna try to do because I have spent the last seven years making this house feel like a sanctuary. And this is the house that the only house all my kids have ever known. This is the house that I brought all three kids home from the hospital from, and you know, I would like to keep it. It's, I'm in a great school district, I'm in a great neighborhood, I have fantastic neighbors who are, you know, they're like family to me. So if there's any chance of keeping it, I would, I would like to do that. Notice that none of it is about <laughs> status or because I need a house, to be honest, Bernie, this house is bigger than I would like it to be. I would love to be in like a bungalow half this size. If I can stay in this house, I will. I just don't think I will be able to. Who knows? 
Nothing is impossible with God, so we'll see what the future holds. And I'm a couple weeks away from launching my pottery business. And again, let me know if you want a separate video on how much, kind of the storyline of the, the, those embers that I was talking about. I think it is such a, I choose to say God thing, you might say universe thing or whatever. As one thing was ending, this new thing was starting. There are so many metaphors on why I feel like the pottery business had to happen now and couldn't happen before. Anyway, um, I'm a few weeks away from launching that and it's, y'all, it's a massive leap of faith. I have invested my heart, I have invested my mind, my energy, my time, my space, my money, my savings that I have, you know, piddled away over the last year. A lot of it has been invested into the business and I'm taking a huge leap of faith and who knows, maybe I will launch West Cottage and I will sell out of all the pieces that I have so far, which is about 40 pieces. Or maybe I will launch it and sell like one mug. <laughs> I mean, I have no idea how that's gonna go, but it has been such a passion project. You know when you get that hum, like when you get really excited to see someone or you get really excited about an event or you get that hum when you're having a really good conversation. I feel like that is a moment that's like a wink from God where it's like you and God or you and the universe, whatever you wanna say, whatever floats your boat, are, are vibrating at the same level and you are at the intersect of where you are and where you're meant to be. When those things intersect, you get that hum. And I have such a hum about West Cottage and it feels like home in a lot of ways and it has felt like my life preserve in a lot of ways um so maybe if you want i can do a video expanding more on that but i'm a few weeks away from launching that which is huge and i'm excited to see what that looks like in 2021 maybe it will totally flounder or maybe it will be you know very successful we'll we'll see time will tell 2020 is ending at the same time that all of these really transient life stuff is also kind of ending and I'm starting this whole new chapter in the end of December. Like it's, it's really kind of incredible. And who knows what 2021 is, is gonna be. Um, you can't sit in my lap while Brighton is also sitting in my lap. It's just like, it just can't happen. Hello, it's my future calling. You want to talk to it? Okay, you say hello. <laughs> so here's to no longer equating control with safety. Here's to embracing the unknown and realizing that the unknown Living in the transient does not have to mean bad or stressful. As I said, I'm gonna be spending the weekend doing my whole life and home audit. If you guys wanna do it alongside me, sorry for the annoying noise. She's again pushing the stool. I would love for you to do it alongside me and I will have the link in the description box below. 